<laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry about that. They, they caught us by surprise. As I was just saying, you know, uh, uh, today I said we're going to fly through things and still we're going. So, but that's great. And we left with a very provocative question from JR talking about um, whether there was a sincere effort or uh, to end the war um, based on, for example, the economic needs. Um, and again, my answer to that based on what we know so far is that um, I don't think the Americans were actually in any hurry to develop any kind of peace plan for Vietnam. Um, but I'm not sure that one can tie the continuation of the war to any particular economic motive in the sense that, you know, profits are going to win on. In fact, um, we're still doing economic work. In fact, I'm doing some of that now. And I would argue, in fact, that Vietnam in the long term, although it had a short range, very positive effect by heating the economy up, in the long range was a disaster because it occurred when an economy was quite strong already and you had great society programs and things like that, a, large, a, a very large level of federal spending. But I would say that, again, invoking the old, you know, my favorite thing, credibility, that, yeah, the U.S., I think, was reluctant to end the war. I think that there was a, a piecemeal, if that, um, attempt to do so because to end it on terms like that would indicate failure. Um, I think I've mentioned before the whole decent interval idea. This has to do with the Nixon years, and, what, and, and Frank Snepp, a CIA officer, came up with this and wrote a book about it. It was fairly common within the CIA. The idea for the last four or five years wasn't to win, but to keep the war going long enough to provide a decent interval between the de-escalation and the eventual withdrawal and failure. So, yeah, I mean, in that regard, I don't think there was any overwhelming desire to end the war as quickly as possible. I don't think, you know, and if you look at, you know, the book I've written, Masters of War, I mean, my argument there is that the military and civilians were both reluctant to do that because they had their own power play going on. Um, to tie it directly to, you know, Dow Chemical Profits is very, very difficult. I, I'd be unwilling to do that. But in the overall picture, when you take issues like credibility, and the continuation of war to avoid blame, uh, whether it be civil military acrimony, as I suggest, or a decent interval, as SNAP suggests, then, yeah, I think you can make that claim that there, you know, there, there were people who weren't all that upset that it was going on. And I think it, it just also made such a wonderful laboratory, you know, the same as with the Gulf War, you know, to, to, to test out all of these marvelous new weapons that we developed. And p people have made that yeah. argument before. Um, there yeah. are military people who said that the promotion system you know, was so strong that, you know, Vietnam was great. Uh, David Shoup, a general, and uh, James uh, Donovan, a, a Marine colonel, both argued that, you know, so long as the medals and the promotions were flying around, there was not a great incentive to, to get this thing over with that soon. I guess, you know, and having sit, sat here for the first half of the uh, session today and really just kind of getting, listening and, and getting sort of angry as we're talking about body counts and as, and which led me to think about, you know, the other aspects and elements of our culture and our society here in the United States and and our ethnocentricity and just just everything about us and how we could sacrifice our young in that way and others young and and just the whole thing, the the mentality that was required to engage, stay in, and and be involved in in there. There are in, two books in, which aren't about Vietnam per se. One very briefly touches on it; the other doesn't at all, which I think are really appropriate to that question. Um, Richard Slotkin's Regeneration Through Violence, and Richard Drennan's Facing West, and both of them really create a larger, much larger picture of violence in the founding and the settlement of of the United States. Uh, um, Drennan's book is about it's called the Metaphysics of Indian Hating and how the destruction of Native Americans really has created a paradigm which you can see throughout uh, all of American history. And so uh, body counts is particularly consistent with that. I mean, read accounts of like the Pequot War and read accounts of My Lai, and I mean, they're almost interchangeable. So yeah, I, th I think that there is something you know larger and more profound at play, very disturbing too, which is why um, you don't see that really discussed or handled very frequently because it, it, the implications, if taken, you know, in a particular way are, are really quite profoundly disturbing. I mean, that's why, you know, we'll briefly talk about Milai and Cali, but, you know, you either blame Cali 
and you court martial him or you see this as a procedure, a systemic thing, and nobody wants to do that. And so you isolate Cali. I mean, you know, he really was a scapegoat. You know, let's face it. Yeah. Wouldn't he just following orders from the captain? Well, yeah, that was his argument. And in fact, I think there's pretty good evidence that that was the case. And in fact, he was the only one court martialed when there were others in that unit who, military people, I mean, you go to conference, you know, I've been to conferences before where I've heard a lot of senior officers say that was a disgrace. You know, the, the, f several people should have been court martialed on that. Yeah, so again, I mean, you know, the alternative is to see this as, as a procedure or as something systemic, and that's far more frightening, isn't it? Could you just repeat the authors for Facing West? Uh, Richard Drinnen, D-R-I-N-N-O-N, and uh, Richard Slotkin, S-L-O-T-K-I-N. Uh, and those are both very good books which kind of touch on some of these issues. I mean, if you're going to try to understand foreign policy or Vietnam, and you read those, I think it puts it in a larger context. Now, a lot of people think they're wrong, and, you know, you may too. But, you know, I found them really kind of illustrative of much larger issues. Uh, one thing about Vietnam, it, it, to spend this much time on it, you know, it's something I've learned a lot about and I have a great interest in. But at the same time, it almost can be taken out of a larger context, and I don't think it's really that much of an aberration. Um, somebody said, well, we'd be studying this if we had won the war. Well, I think, yeah, you'd still be studying it, but you'd be dealing with it a lot differently, of course, right? I mean, now we look upon Vietnam as an aberration, in a sense. It's different, and that's why we study it, and I'm not sure it is. Granted, the outcome was different, but I think a lot of these things you can find in many different kinds of conflict, not just wars, but, you know, kinds of social issues and things like that. So those books, I think, are useful in that regard. All right, um, very briefly, because I've talked about this before, military division. And I think it's important why, you know, I keep coming back to this time and again, because I think it says a lot about the way the war was fought. I mean, one of the, the arguments I've made consistently is that this war was misguided from the start. You know, there was no unity of purpose. There was no real consistent approach to it. And so I think when you look at the military's own analyses of the situation, this really confirms and corroborates this. We talked earlier, I'll go quickly, we talked earlier, Westmoreland strategy of attrition. There are really kind of two keystones to Westmoreland strategy, attrition and constant reinforcements, more troops. And within the military, there was a great critique of this, especially from the Marines. We talked about their emphasis on pacification, their emphasis on uh, a, a hearts and minds approach. Whether this would have worked is another question. Frankly, one has, one has to have doubts about it because of the political situation in Vietnam. But, in fact, um, pacification was never really attempted, and this was an alternative strategy. Um, the idea there is that American forces would pacify a very small area, a small village or a hamlet, and then move out from there. They called it the oil blot approach, you know, like an oil stain spreading out. So it's a very small war. It's a war based on security, clearly. You have to provide fill security, but beyond that, it's a war based on economic development, on education, on reform, on economic development, providing people jobs and land and so forth. All right? Um, this is time consuming and painstaking work. And it is, as LBJ put it, like a jackass hunkering up in a hailstorm, whatever that means, right? Uh, it's not politically viable, given LBJ's own imperatives, which are to get this thing over with, which is why attrition has to be the way to go. At the same time, though, those forces in the military which do advocate pacification, I've mentioned for the Marines, the Army, and its Proven report. Remember that? I, I talked about Harold K. Johnson, PROVN, the program for the, what's this province stand for? Program for the Reconstruction of South Vietnam or something like that, or rebuilding or rural, whatever. I, I think it might be the program for the long term development of, of Vietnam. Yeah, that's it, what he said. Um, uh, in both of those cases, you have, you know, really sharp critiques of Westmoreland strategy. Uh, Victor Krulak, a name I've mentioned before, is really, you know, really kind of one of the most trenchant critics of Westmoreland. Um, and he points out that Westmoreland's strategy of attrition is incredibly counterproductive because, um, in a sense, that crossover point will never be reached. Hanoi, northern Vietnam, has over two and a half million men that it could send into battle in the south if it has to. Two and a half million all right. Can the U.S. send two and a half million men into Vietnam? And my God, two and a half million soldiers? Uh, you know, it's just unthinkable. Um, should the Chinese intervene? And again, we can dismiss that now, but in 1967 and 68, you can't dismiss that. If China intervenes, you're looking at a potential manpower pool of 100 million. Okay? They did it in Korea. Why is it impossible that they'll do it in Vietnam? 
right? And later on we'll talk. I mean, the, the Chinese claim now that they were quite serious about it, that, that if the need had arisen, they would have done so. I mean, can the U.S. match this? Of course not. So Krulak is saying that this crossover point hasn't been reached, and basically Westmoreland's strategy is, quote, wasteful of American lives, and it promises a protracted, strength-sapping battle with a small likelihood of successful outcome. Krulak says, if U.S. troops killed 10 VC for every one of their own lost, it's still not going to do much because just to reduce the enemy's pool by 20%, the U.S. would have to kill about 200,000. So this war of attrition is coming up with huge body counts, whether they're accurate or not is another question altogether. And what's it doing? It's reducing the pool by a small number, and their ability to reinforce still outpaces that. All right. So manpower, Krulak says, is Ho Chi Minh's greatest strength. And, quote, we have no license and less reason to join battle with him on that ground. And this, again, speaks to that whole idea of enemy initiative. Wallace Green, the commandant of the Marine Corps, agreed and said, we could kill all of the Pavan and VC in the South and still lose the war because the enemy's replacing its losses and it still retains the loyalty or the fear of the people. So again, without pacification, nothing really uh, uh, is accomplished. Um, uh, Krulak says, uh, um, the enemy's casualty rates might be 50 times what ours is, but they'll win anyway because of their capability to wage a war of attrition. Body counts, Krulak and, and Wallace Green said, uh, brought no clear success. They didn't really prove anything. Uh, perhaps the most damning uh, uh, indictment came from uh, Green, who said that the strategy of attrition was like a grindstone that the communists are pushing, being that's scraping all the skin off of our backs, and they're going to be able to win because they can keep this grindstone going, the grindstone being manpower. So within the military, then, there's this continued uh, uh, attack on Westmoreland strategy. Um, through the Marines, through the Army and its Provence Report, through people like John Paul Van. As I said before, I think I, I mentioned this anecdote. Van, uh, uh, in 1967, was in Vietnam, and uh, Walt Rostow was visiting, the National Security Advisor, and Rostow asked Van in 67 if he thought the war would end within the next six months, to which Van replies, oh, hell no, Mr. Rostow, I think we can hold out a lot longer than that. Okay. Um, so it's fairly clear then, by 1967, despite this incredibly growing commitment, uh, despite continued reinforcements, that the enemy held the initiative and that within uh, the U.S. military uh, there was real division and a really caustic critique of Westmoreland's approach to the war. All right? This brings us up to late 1967, which is essentially the eve of the famous or infamous uh, uh, Tet Offensive. Um, and before we get to Tet, I want to kind of branch off and do a couple other things. Does anybody have any questions on this stuff right now? All right, so we actually did do three years in half a class, which is better than six months in a whole class. All right, so we're really moving now. Yeah? Did you mention Wilson? Wilson and Van kind of go together? As, Wilbur Wilson? Uh, yeah. As, um, as critics? Yeah, Wilbur uh, Wilson was another Boston. advisor uh, who's real fascinating. Um, I just found a little bit of stuff on him at the, uh, the, the, the Military History Institute of Carlisle Barracks, just a couple small folders, and I'd really like to find out more, not just about Wilson and Van, but I mean all junior officers. I think we've talked about this before. Yeah, Wilbur Wilson was also very critical, um, just never as famous as Van. Um, and if you read Neil Sheehan's book on Van, he talks about a fairly large number of advisors who you know were, were uh, uh, very critical, like Van. I think I think he talks about Wilson. Um, I mean, it wasn't an isolated movement by any means within the army, uh, or you know, within the armed forces. Right. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about something that we've only recently found out more about, and that's the kind of more international aspect of the Vietnam War. And much of this is going to come from those articles which you should um, be reading or have read already from the reader. Uh, on um, by Ayu Gai Duk and uh, was Quang Ji on China and, and Vietnam, and I want to kind of just very briefly uh, go over them, uh, and I still expect you uh, to read them. And, and I think the reason this is important is because it, again, shows the broader context of the war, and it also speaks to some of the issues that the United States had to deal with at the time. We tend to kind of see a bipolar situation here, the United States, Vietnam. And in fact, there's a lot more to it than that. We forget that this occurs as a product of the Cold War, which is global. 
And so Vietnam is often taken out of context and you see it as an aberration, when in fact it's not. And, and now we have um, a lot of Chinese scholars and Soviet scholars, Quang Jai, uh, Chan Jen, and uh, Ilya Gaiaduk, most notably, who've done some work in this area. And we learn more and more about the larger role of these other countries. Um, and it's real interesting. I mean, I think it, it really adds some texture to what we know. Typically, um, Ho Chi Minh was seen as a puppet of Mao or of Brezhnev or whoever, Stalin, Brezhnev. And, you know, um, this is seen as kind of part of the larger communist conspiracy, if you want to use John Foster Dulles' terminology. But in fact, um, the role of the Soviet Union and the Chinese and the relationships between China, the Soviet Union, and Vietnam was actually far more nuanced uh, than one would normally think. Um, Ho Chi Minh, first of all, and again, this is a lot of this stuff now is based on records from China and from the USSR. Uh, in the past several years, a lot of uh, repositories and archives have been opened, and we have not a, a, a large number by any means, but we now have, you know, some documents from China and from the Soviet Union with regard to Vietnam. And so based on that information, what we can now conclude, I think fairly clearly, is one, that Ho Chi Minh was in no way a puppet of, of either of these powers, and we'll see why in a minute. I mean, Ho, like he plays off the French and the Japanese, and everybody else plays off China and the Soviet Union. Never accepts direction from them, but at the same time is more than willing to accept support and aid. And so they play a very important role in the Vietnamese Revolution in that regard. They help out quite a bit, no question about that. Do they tell him what to do? Do they call the shots? I would argue absolutely not. Ho retains his independence, right? Does he work with them? Sure. Does he travel and visit? Absolutely. Is he in solidarity with them? No question, okay? Is he a puppet? I would absolutely not. And again, I think, you know, the salient point here is does the level of the relationship between Ho Chi Minh and the communist powers, how does that compare to the level of a relationship or dependency that the South Vietnamese have with the U.S.? And again, I would argue it's not even close. I mean, without the, without the United States, there is no South Vietnam. Without China and the Soviet Union, Ho Chi Minh is still around. And the war is going to be more difficult, but I'm not sure it would have ended differently. So I don't think there's any question that the, the Southern Vietnamese dependency on the U.S. is massively greater than, than Ho's relationship with China and the Soviet Union. And American military officials make that same point. The level of support, if you look at it in, in measurable terms like uh, tons of equipment or number of weapons or number of aircraft, is always going to be really pretty much a fraction of what the U.S. is doing for uh, South Vietnam. All right. uh, and in fact, uh, from the beginning, the Soviet Union had very little role to play. Uh, their intervention comes much later. Uh, in the 1950s, the Soviet Union did virtually nothing, so there's a particular irony and accusing Ho of being a Stalinist because, in fact, Stalin and his successors th during the Khrushchev years really did very little to help the, uh, uh, the Vietnamese. In fact, remember at, uh, at Geneva, 1954, uh, what does Zhou Enlai, what does Molotov do? I mean, they, they go along with the partition of Vietnam. Uh, you know, cynics would say that Mao probably encouraged it. He didn't want to see a strong communist state on his borders. So Mao and Zhou don't really intervene on behalf of the Vietnamese at Geneva nor does the Soviet Union. Um, they do begin, though, to um, have a relationship, uh, to have communication with among the, the communist powers. After Dien Bien Phu, after Geneva, for example, uh, General Jop travels to Beijing for military instruction. Uh, uh, he meets uh, there with uh, both Chinese and Soviet military advisors. And what do they tell him? that the Vietnamese should, should pursue the path of peaceful coexistence between the North and the South, and that Hanoi should, quote, reunify the country through peaceful means on the basis of independence and democracy. Now, you can throw out the independence and democracy thing or whatever if you want, but the fact of the matter is Ho is being advised to be cautious by the Chinese and the Russians in the 1950s. At the same time, though, the Chinese do support Ho Chi Minh. In the war against the French, China was giving about a thousand tons of material monthly, a thousand tons, that's 20,000 pounds of material monthly. That is not a tremendous amount of support. And as uh, um, Admiral Radford, the American chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, pointed out, it's way less than we're giving to the French at the time. All right? um, Ho Chi Minh was in kind of a, uh, a, a 
difficult situation, something of a paradox. He's Vietnamese. So if you're a Vietnamese nationalist, what is your general impression of China? You don't really like them. You don't trust them. It's just a traditional mistrust, you know, like, you know, France and Britain in the, in, in, uh, throughout the course of centuries fought several wars, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries. There's just a general distrust there. Uh, even more so, I think the Vietnamese just trust the Chinese. But at the same time, Ho Chi Minh is isolated. How many countries recognize the DRVN? Very few. So you can't go around picking and choosing. What's the West's approach? Basically hands off. That's America's problem. That's France's problem. So Ho can't really find support elsewhere, so he has to look to Mao Zedong, who he doesn't trust, for it. Um, so in the early years, in the 1950s, Ho was going to get a far better response from China than he is from the Soviet Union. Uh, the Chinese tell him that uh, the West will sabotage the Geneva Accords, which is what Ho already knew, that, you know, don't count on them having elections in 1956. Um, and that they tell, uh, the Chinese suggest that Ho prepare for a protracted war. This is going to take a long time, and Ho already knows that. All right, so on one hand, the level is very close. At the same time, uh, I don't want to go into details because it can get quite, you know, boring, frankly, but there are a lot of doctrinal differences, too. Uh, the idea that John Foster Dulles had that all communists were alike, or the, you know, the famous duck test, if it smells like a duck and looks like a duck, were really silly because the communist nations really saw things quite differently even as early as the 1950s. And in fact, for a short period of time, uh, there was a real split between the Vietnamese and the Chinese in the late 1950s. Um, and this has to do with some real doctrinaire issues. But for a time, the Chinese actually withdrew their military advisors from Vietnam. Um, this actually has to do with, remember when I talked about the land reform when Trong Chin sent the troops out and several thousand peasants were killed. At that point, Lei Duan, another party official, essentially accused Trong Chin of being too closely allied to Chinese ideas. Basically, when all the peasants are killed during land reform in the north, Lei Duan says that this was because Trong Chin follows the Chinese model rather than the Vietnamese model. And if you follow the Vietnamese model, you're not going to go killing peasants. The Chinese do that. We don't. And so the Chinese basically bolt. They're really ticked off at Lei Duan for blaming him for Trong Chin. And Trong Chin was closer to the Chinese. I know it's very doctrinaire stuff. But the point is that the Vietnamese and the Chinese have a split in 1957. And China bolts. Okay? And um, in fact, later that year, as I said before, Trong Chin was sacked. And not only is he sacked for land reform, but this is also seen as a way of distancing Hanoi from Beijing. Okay? These things always have great, little things tend to have great symbolism when you're dealing with, you know, politburos and, and communist leadership and things like that. So um, there's actually a split then between Hanoi and Beijing in the late 1950s. Uh, and in fact, uh, in that period, uh, both the Chinese and the Soviet Union were still encouraging Ho Chi Minh to be cautious, as I say, from caution to war. So you have a level of support, but at the same time, you have um, a real sense of caution, and this dovetails with Ho's own natural tendencies to be cautious in that matter, right? Um, for example, at one point, the Vietnamese show the Chinese their plan for the future, which is, you know, Ho's basic attitude is we have to use political mobilization rather than military means to unify their country. And the Chinese communist Mao and Zhou Enlai respond that the most fundamental, the most crucial, and the most urgent task is to develop socialism above the 17th parallel to conduct long-term preparations and wait for opportunities. So you see then, like Ho Chi Minh, the Chinese urging caution, urging time, move slowly. And so these people have to respond to the southern insurgency, right? After 1960, however, when the National Liberation Front is developed, the Chinese uh, adapt. And this is where they really get ahead of the Soviet Union. Uh, beginning around 1960-61, China begins to take a far more active and aggressive role in Vietnam. The Soviet Union is not going to do so for another four years or so. Um, as the war heats up in 1960, especially in 1961 when Kennedy comes to office, um, the Chinese uh, basically meet that challenge. Uh, in 1961, Pham Van Dong, the uh, premier of North Vietnam, traveled to Beijing where he met with Mao and Mao expressed his support now for armed struggle. So by 61, China is going to take a far more active role militarily in Vietnam.
the Soviet Union is still years off. Ironically, the Soviet Union is probably going to do more in the long term for South Vietnam. Ho really used the Soviet Union for his own purposes, both, both sides in, in many ways, but, but the Soviet Union even more. So as the war grows in the early 1960s, Ho Chi Minh's contacts, Hanoi's contacts, with both Beijing and Moscow grow as well. And the Chinese are still doing more. Um, in the 50s and early 60s, for instance, they provide the DRV, the PAV and the NLF, whatever you want to call it, the Viet Cong, with about over a quarter million guns, with over 10,000 artillery pieces, millions of artillery shells, thousands of wire transmitters, over a thousand trucks, aircraft, some ships, and uniforms. And in fact, the Americans will often justify their commitment to Vietnam because the Chinese are helping them out, which really was, you know, kind of putting the cart before the horse because China, in fact, I think more likely was responding to the American escalation of the war. To give China agency for the escalation of Vietnam is, is you know, pretty crazy, frankly. I mean, you know, obviously, if anybody's escalating that war, it's, it's, Je it's uh, Kennedy and Johnson. But still, the United States uses this as a ruse. You know, we're, we're escalating the war because China is so deeply involved when, in fact, China's level of participation was, was nothing. I mean, 270,000 guns, you know, the, the VC had more M16s than that. So, um, so Beijing, though, is taking a much larger interest. Um, Mao Zedong, you know, again, this is only 15 years removed from the Korean War, is afraid of this happening again. He doesn't want American troops to uh, uh, get that close. Remember in Korea, uh, MacArthur crosses the 38th parallel and that heads north to the Yalu River, which separates China and Korea. Um, well, obviously Mao doesn't want the same thing to happen. There's a huge, huge, uh, uh, not huge, 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 but quite significant uh, distance from the 17th parallel to northern Vietnam and the Chinese border, but Mao likes it and he wants to keep it that way. And he doesn't want the Americans to get any crazy ideas about coming north. And so he perceives his own security being involved in Vietnam, even though the distance is fairly great from the 17th parallel uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Chinese border. He's still remembering Korea doesn't want American forces so close to his own borders, right? Um, so in, in 1964, Mao tells uh, uh, North Vietnam, our two parties and our two countries must cooperate and fight the enemy together. Your business is my business and my business is your business. In other words, our two sides must deal with the enemy with no conditions. So he is linking the struggles together, uh, I think, for security reasons, also for ideological reasons. I mean, in addition to that, isn't this a nice, fairly low-cost way to make the U.S. look bad? Instead of having to deal with them frontally, you let them get bogged down in Vietnam. So I think both China and the Soviet Union see this as a fairly low-cost investment to make the Americans get mud on their face, to get egg on their face, without having to physically do it themselves. As a result, Beijing begins to take a, an even greater role. They continue to support the Vietnamese. They put some of their military units on a state of alert in the north uh, in the event that something happens. Um, they send jets, they send a few jets to Hanoi, they offer to train Vietnamese pilots, they give sanctuary and maintenance to some DRVN aircraft. Um, again, this is fairly limited because North Vietnam really has no air force to speak of. So again, on one hand, yes, China is helping. On another hand, it's not terribly significant. And again, compared to American aid to the South, it's, it's almost nothing, right? Um, and this continues throughout the 1960s then. Um, Mao and Zhou Enlai meet quite frequently with Vietnamese officials, with Ho Chi Minh, with Pham Van Dong, with Le Duan and others. There are record memoranda from meetings from the, throughout the 1960s, 1963 through 68, all the way through. You see fairly close contact between China and, 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 um, and Vietnam, between Mao and Zhou Enlai and Ho Chi Minh and Pham Van Dong and others. Um, and Mao's advice uh, is very uh, similar to the way uh, Von Nguyen Jap and others are fighting the war. Um, Mao Zedong is encouraging the Vietnamese to continue to fight a guerrilla war, um, to continue this war of attrition, to not engage them in big unit uh, uh, engagements. Mao is not impressed by America's ability um, to fight or cut off the insurgency in South Vietnam. And uh, um, 
Mao Zedong, I, I love saying this because I don't really understand it, but the Chinese have a wonderful proclivity for sayings that sound very ethereal and, and profound. I'm not sure what they ever mean, but uh, Mao Zedong says that if the United States engages North Vietnam, it will quite, quote, fight for 100 years and its legs will be trapped. That's just wonderful imagery, but it gets better. Mao Zedong tells Pham Von Dong, you must not engage your main forces in head-to-head -head confrontation with the Americans, and you must well maintain your main force. My opinion is that so long as the Green Mountain is there, how can you ever lack firewood? Uh, and I think there's, it probably makes sense at some point. I think basically he's talking about a war of attrition. Don't engage your main forces. Uh, don't lose too many soldiers, and you're always going to have a steady supply of firewood. Greenwood meaning manpower. Okay. Um, at the Zhou Enlai collaborates on this. So Mao and Zhou throughout the 1960s basically continue their level of support uh, to Vietnam and at the same time they're um, encouraging Ho Chi Minh and Von Nguyen Jap to fight the war, uh, to continue to fight the war uh, in the way that they did. Um, Zhou Enlai it goes further than that too though by essentially uh, uh, throwing the possibility of Chinese intervention out there. Um, McNamara and others gave some thought to that. Uh, in fact, even though McNamara thought Ye Drong was in some ways a great victory, he also understood that if you do too much of this, too many of these big unit engagements, you could provoke Chinese intervention. So uh, uh, China decides to play on that. Zhou Enlai at one point says that we will go to Vietnam if Vietnam is in need as we did in Korea. So Zhou says this in, in 1965, and he says, the war will have no limits if the U.S. expands it into Chinese territory. The U.S. can fight an air war, yet China can also fight a ground war. And again, this is, when you think about it, it's fairly sobering. I mean, you know, you can dismiss that if you want, but if you're LBJ, the thought of a, a land war in China cannot be terribly comforting. And what do you do, nuke them, you know, atomic bomb? I mean, that's short of, short of air power, you know, what, what do you do? And this is what Zhou Enlai is saying. You can fight an air war, but we can fight a ground war. So if you send troops in, you know, you, you just don't want to do that. So again, Johnson understands this. And he did prevent, pro avoid provoking the Chinese ever to that point. He was quite cautious about it. I mean, quite often LBJ would say something along the lines, what do we do when the volunteers come in? Using the term volunteers because during the Korean War, China referred to the, its troops which intervened as volunteers, maybe 300,000 to a million. I'm not sure what the real numbers are on that. Chinese volunteers. So, you know, Johnson's constantly saying, what do we do if the volunteers come in? Meaning if China starts sending troops in, we're, we're really in deep trouble, right? And no one from the United States can ever sit down and assure LBJ that that won't happen as much as they'd like to. Because of that, also, China is predisposed to help even more. There's, an, uh, there's a, this understanding that um, Vietnam is fighting the war correctly, they're taking their time, protracted warfare. There's also an assumption, probably a correct one, that the United States is never going to do too much for fear of provoking China. So Mao feels free to, to increase um, his support. And so throughout the 1960s, you start to see uh, uh, greater uh, uh, involvement by China. At the same time, though, China, we talked about the United States being, you know, kind of maybe reluctant to end the war. China is as well. And in fact, whenever the United States suggests negotiations to end the war, or whenever Vietnam suggests negotiations to end the war, China is there to try to scuttle those. Um, China suggests that the United States is, is uh, uh, quote, just wants to open talks to deceive public opinion. All right, practice means victory. Patience can cause you more hardship more suffering, yet the sky will not collapse, the earth will not slide, and the people cannot be totally exterminated. Don't end the war based on a negotiated settlement. Fight until victory. This is China's uh, recommendation to Vietnam. Right? So China then increases its aid, but at the same time um, is uh, also reluctant to have Vietnam possibly end the war. Um, China, by 1967, is supplying Vietnam with a, 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 not only weapons but food, too. 100,000 tons of rice, 50,000 tons of corn, uh, a total contribution of over 500,000 tons of food in 1967 already. So China, again, has a vital role to play. Right? What's the Soviet role? Well, Vietnam becomes part of the feud between Beijing and Moscow. 
the Soviet Union offered support to Vietnam, but never to the level that China did. And in fact, before 1964, the Soviet Union did very little with regard to helping uh, the Vietnamese out. Um, the Soviet Union suspected that Ho Chi Minh was too close to Mao and always, in fact, not unlike the Americans, saw Ho not as a puppet of Mao, but clearly as being in his camp. Uh, finally, after uh, Nikita Khrushchev is, is ousted and Brezhnev takes over in 1964, does the Soviet Union take a larger role in uh, Vietnam? Uh, they began first to publicly denounce what they called American aggression in Vietnam. Um, they increased their military assistance there. Uh, between 1963 and 67, the Soviet Union sent over a billion rubles of military supplies to Vietnam. They sent uh, German and Russian made weapons to the Vietnamese. They sent surface to air missiles, jets, rockets, field artillery, and air defense, uh, surface to air missiles especially. Um, in material terms, I think the Soviet Union actually did more to help the Vietnamese than did the Chinese. In addition to that, economic aid flowed freely. The Soviet Union provided 50 percent of all aid to North Vietnam by 1968, a total package to that point of over 1.8 billion rubles. Uh, I don't know Soviet economic history at all. I'm not sure anybody's doing it, but it would be real interesting to see what the economic effect of the Vietnam War was on the Soviet Union in the 1970s. I suspect it wasn't good. I think we could safely assume that there was some fallout. don't know how great it would be, but the Soviet Union spent a tremendous amount of money on Vietnam. I mean, uh, when I read about this and think about it, it almost reminds me of what France did for the Americans during the War for Independence in the 1770s and 1780s, where France expended a huge amount of money and in the end didn't get a whole lot out of it. And it helped contribute to the downfall of, of the uh, Ancien Regime in, in, uh, during the French Revolution. And, you know, I, I don't know if the Russians have anywhere near that, but I suspect that it's not a good thing. I think we can safely assume that. So the Vietnamese basically are, are helping to pay significant amounts of the bills, far more than China is. But it's also part of that feud between Beijing and Moscow. Uh, these are the rival centers of power in the communist world. And so Vietnam becomes essentially, if not, not really a pawn, but clearly an object, and Ho Chi Minh understands that. And Ho, who is a master, a strategic master at this, again does it. I mean, just as he would play off the French and the, the, the Americans and the, and the Japanese or whoever, he's willing to do that with the Chinese and the Soviet Union as well. Yeah. Did that feud get started basically because Mao insisted on uh, asserting his independence, did, did Moscow initially view this as like, you know, our, you know, yeah, we can, I mean, we I, can I, control if, this? If anything, I think the aberration in, in the relationship between China and the Soviet Union was that they got along at all, ever. They were not predisposed to do that. In 1945, if you remember, um, Stalin agrees to recognize Chiang Kai-shek, John Jershi, and the Kuomintang is the official government of China. And, you know, in 1949, Mao's victory is, is it's a fait accompli. It's a real deal. So, yeah, the Soviet Union and China do start to have, you know, relationships and contacts and whatnot. But, by, you know, within 10 years, they're, they're falling apart. Yes, they, they have different approaches to the world. The Chinese are accusing the Soviet Union of basically selling out, of going soft, of not supporting revolution enough. Um, I mean, China, you know, by, by 1960s, uh, third world revolutionaries, even, you know, kind of Mustang Maoists and American colleges, you know, are, are really see China as the model for revolution. A lot of the third world does. Um, many of these movements in the third world would take a, a, a more of a Maoist approach rather than a Soviet Union approach, the Soviet approach. The Soviet Union is seen as kind of old, dinosaurs, bureaucratic. The real future is in red China, right? I mean, you know, you would have literally kids on college campuses driving their new Mustangs with a, pick, with a little red book in their back pocket, Mustang Maoist. It's, it's a wonderful image, isn't it? A friend of mine was in a uh, Maoist co-op in Santa Barbara. <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. You know, that was the revolution was going to start in Santa Barbara, right? A bunch of Maoists there, you know, educated college kids, right? Who really can identify with a poor peasant in, in Shanghai or wherever, right? Um, but yeah, there's real tension there. So the fact that th they were, you know, feuding over Vietnam shouldn't come as any surprise at all. And Ho understands this. You have two suitors, you play them off against each other uh, to your own advantage. Um, 
And Russia really gets, I think, the short end of the stick. One Vietnamese journalist uh, said that uh, Russia, I'm sorry, one Russian journalist, Soviet journalist, uh, estimated that the Soviet Union was probably supplying Vietnam with about three-fourths of all of its outside aid. Yet he said if you configure the amount of influence Russia has, the Soviet Union has in Vietnam, it's probably about 10 percent. So it's a real take and not much give relationship. Ho will take everything he can get from the Soviet Union and in return doesn't do a whole lot for them. So if you have sympathy for Brezhnev, then Ho really did him wrong, okay? <laughs> Honor among thieves isn't there, right? What did Dylan say? To live outside the law, you must be honest. But apparently uh, these guys didn't listen to Blonde on Blonde or something like that. Um, what is happening while the Soviet Union is, is aiding uh, China? China is telling the Vietnamese not to take it. China is constantly trying to interject itself in that relationship. They are afraid that Ho will become too close to the Russians. And they go on constantly about the danger of selling out to the Soviet Union. Zhou Enlai said that Brezhnev is nothing new. The, the, the new Soviet parter, party leadership in 1964 is carrying out nothing but Khrushchevism. It is absolutely impossible for them to change. They're old bureaucratic dinosaurs. They have no feel for revolution in the third world, right? They're no different than the Americans. I mean, many of the Chinese believe that. America, Soviet Union, basically the same thing, a bunch of old bureaucratic guys, a bunch of old bureaucratic white guys, in fact, who really don't understand that, that the future of the world is in the non-white areas and that revolution is inevitable and they're trying to forestall the inevitability of socialism and that kind of thing. Um, in fact, Zhou Enlai says that they are not trustworthy, the Soviet Union is not trustworthy, and it will abandon the cause of social, social, uh, socialist revolution to make an accommodation with the capitalist enemy. And of course, this comes, thus comes the famous uh, uh, Chinese criticism of people being capitalist roaders. It's one of the worst things you can be in China. A capitalist road means you're taking the capitalist road. Okay? Looks like he knew what he was talking about, at least to Who's me. that? Joe? Yeah. Yeah, and what did China do, of course, after he died? You know, zoop. <laughs> that long and winding capitalist road, right? <laughs> um, yeah, the Beatles wrote songs about that, you know. Love Mao Do, stuff like that. It's a joke. I uh, probably should spend my time more creatively, right? You're hot today, Dr. Yeah, Pisanko. thank you. No, no rim shot? No. I'll be playing at the Gallant Night next week, uh, opening, you know, so. I have a tip jar. I put a tip jar on my desk from now on. If you people on TV want to send it in, just send it to my email address. Take Visa, you know. Okay. Oh, it's that old credibility problem again. It, it always happens. It's 34 minute mark. It always happens about then. I get groggy. I get loopy. All right. Pretty soon I can tell you about how I was there with Joe and Mao. <laughs> um, now, basically the Chinese, I'm kind of beating a dead horse. It's pretty clear now. The Chinese don't like the Soviet Union and they want the Soviet Union and the Vietnamese to stay apart. So Joe and Lai says the Soviet revisionists want North Vietnam to talk with the United States to put the NLF aside and sell out its brothers. It's pretty ugly all right, to beat a dead horse. The Vietnamese and the Chinese and the Soviet Union are really in this triangle. All right? it's, it's kind of a lover's triangle, I guess, in that sense. And Beijing and Moscow, China and the Soviet Union really are at odds over what to do with regard to Vietnam. And the Chinese are constantly trying to drive Vietnam away from the Soviet Union. You are, stay, you are saying that the Soviets are, I'm sorry, uh, Le Zhuan actually tries to defend the Soviet Union. He says to the Chinese, you're saying that the Soviets are selling out Vietnam, but we don't say so. All other problems are rooted in this judgment. We don't believe the Soviet Union is out to take advantage of us. Maybe you are, right? Le Duan says support is needed from all countries. This support is based on internationalism, especially in the context of relations between Vietnam and China. But we need the assistance from all socialist countries. However, we hold the Chinese assistant is the most direct and assistant and uh, insistent and extensive. Sorry. All right. So again, uh, there's a real, real uh, feud going on then with Vietnam in the center of it. This essentially comes to a head in 1968. Um, 1968, as we'll see later, is, is a critical year. Uh, all kinds of stuff is going on all over the world. Um, not just in the United States with regard to the Tet Offensive. There are uh, 
student riots and protests in Paris in May and in uh, Mexico City in October during the Olympics. But for the purposes of the Eastern Bloc, the most important events that year were in Czechoslovakia and Prague. Uh, a group of dissidents and students were trying to create an opening, and for a short time they did, called Prague Spring. Ultimately, Soviet tanks come in and crush this, this, this opening uh, in Czechoslovakia. It's making a very long story very, very, very short. Uh, how does this affect Vietnam? Um, uh, basically, Prague was, was kind of a, a decisive event. You're either pro or you're either for or against the Soviet Union based on what happens uh, in the um, in in Czechoslovakia. In fact, after um, after the, the tanks go in and crush the movement in Czechoslovakia, Fidel Castro, another you know one of the one of the icons of the communist world, gives a very anguished speech. You know, Fidel's four or five six hours long, in which he goes on you know a great length, and ultimately he says, "Yeah, I'll support. I support the Soviet invasion." But he's very anguished, talking about how difficult it was to get to that point. Well, Ho Chi Minh, as a result of Prague and other things, throws his lot in with the Soviet Union and defends the intervention there. Um, so this really is essentially, uh, 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 the Chinese see this uh, basically as a repudiation of what they had done. The Vietnamese are starting to resent Chinese pressure, and they begin to distance themselves. Ho Chi Minh begins to distance himself from China and this becomes particularly acute during the Czech crisis of mid-1968. Um, the Soviet Union sends troops into Czechoslovakia to stop this movement for liberalization. Now the Chinese uh, uh, basically uh, accuse the Soviet Union of deviating from kind of Marxist revolutionary lines and they see this as kind of a bureaucratic, almost counter-revolutionary thing. Right? So there is intense anti-Soviet rhetoric coming out of Beijing Despite that, Ho Chi Minh supports the Czech invasion, which really ticks off the Chinese but brings praise from Moscow. So Hanoi's support of the Russians, which is very open and very explicit, is a signal to the Soviet Union that Vietnam is moving closer to them while remaining independent of, of China. Uh, so the Soviet Union puts pressure on Ho Chi Minh to accede to negotiations. China had been anti-negotiation. The Soviet Union in 1968 suggests that Ho do that. What happens? Negotiations open in Paris later that year. There are a lot of factors for that. It's not because the Soviet Union prodded Ho to the table, not at all. But in fact, China was trying to keep Ho away from negotiating with the United States. The Soviet Union favored it. The Soviet Union thought that it was time for this war to end. China wanted to keep it going. And Ho eventually throws in his lot with the Soviet Union. What did China get out of it? Well, to make a long story short, in 1979, China and, this, and the Vietnamese fought another war, right? So the relationship between China and Vietnam was pretty transient and really in flux. And by the late 1970s, they were at war against each other again. Um, by, uh, um, at what, was, what did the Soviet Union get out of it? Well, like I said, not much. Um, other than maybe, you know, the idea that they tied down the United States in an area that wasn't terribly important. Uh, they didn't gain a whole lot. They spent huge amounts of money, billions of rubles, yet never had a tremendous amount of influence over Vietnam. And even today, there are still a few, you know, kind of remnants of the Soviet involvement there and Soviet support there. But by and large, you know, look at Vietnam. I mean, it's, it's clearly a, a country on the, on the move toward a, a capitalist path of development. Uh, far more American companies there than anything that, that the Russians have or any investment the Russians have. So uh, again, I mean, the Soviet Union and China did play important roles through support, uh, ideological support, material support uh, with China initially and then the Soviet Union ultimately uh, really playing a, a, a role of communist patron. And in the end, Ho Chi Minh played them off against each other, played one, went to the other, and neither actually come out of Vietnam with a great uh, uh, you know, a return on their investment other than keeping the United States at bay and preventing the U.S. from directly uh, uh, conflicting with them, all right? So that's a very quick take on the international aspects of it. It's an area that we're going to learn a lot more about. It's an area that hasn't been covered much, and we're only getting to that point now. Yeah. Just a short one. Sure. Is there, historically, there in West and uh, Central Asia, the relationship between what we call the Soviet Union and uh, and China are there historical animosities that that we 
could find could be attributed to um, that Chinese, that Chinese, Russian, Chinese, Soviet. Um, oh yeah, thing. I mean, uh, I, again, I'm not an expert at that, but they, yeah, it's. I mean, there there are already conflicts before 1949. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, see, the Soviet Union sees itself as both a European and an Asian power, and so if you're an Asian power, then Japan and China, even more Japan, uh, uh, are you know potential barriers to expansion in Asia. I mean, uh, Russia has a was it Port Arthur, World War, uh, right before World War One, Russia colonizes part of China, Port Arthur. I believe that's what it was. Is that it? I, I could be wrong on that, but I think that's what it was called. I know it's in Texas too, right? So Russians came to Texas and colonized that. Um, uh, so yeah, there, there are there are there there's a, a history there, right? And again, I'm not a, a historian of that region, so I don't I, sh I should know it better. Yeah. All right, <sighs> shifting gears again. I uh, haven't done this yet, but I think it's important when you talk about Vietnam to talk about what Vietnam means. Uh, we've talked a lot about the war, and so far we've been in Vietnam most of this time. Right? But obviously, uh, I think most people, when they think of Vietnam, actually think of it in kind of a multi-layered way. They may think of the war, and they may think of scenes on the nightly news or powerful images of maybe a Buddhist monk burning himself or a little girl running down the street after a napalm attack. But I think people also, when they think of Vietnam, think of it as an era or a generation, even more than simply a war. In fact, there's a journal called Vietnam Generation. We often talk of the Vietnam era. And when you think of it that way, in that larger context, um, you're not only thinking of the war, but you're thinking of uh, various images of, um, of that period. And those can include, obviously, things like anti-war protests. Those can include, obviously, things like the civil rights movement or hippies or protest music, uh, whatever. Vietnam becomes far more than a war. It becomes a generation. It becomes an, ec an era, a decade. You know, when you think of World War II, of course you think of the war, but you also think of kind of the, the social system that develops out of that. And Vietnam is the same. And it's important then to talk about that because wars fundamentally transform societies. You can't have any kind of major war without having it affect not just the combatants, but the societies in which that war is being fought. And Vietnam clearly does that. Vietnam occurs at an incredibly intense period in American history. It's a time of movement, growth, reform, ferment, rebellion. And the war leaves its mark on everything else that's going on. I would argue, and I do, that Vietnam is the key event in this entire period. Vietnam occurs when there are already some movements active and in play, like civil rights, which clearly precedes the war. It occurs at a time simultaneous with uh, movements for political accountability, like the student movement, SDS, participatory democracy. Uh, it takes over certain movements. The anti-war movement basically becomes more important than the other movements do and becomes the dominant movement in that period. So whenever you talk about the 1960s and the other issues associated with it, the student left, the great society, civil rights, women's liberation, the counterculture, hippies, music, film, you can't look at those in the 1960s without putting Vietnam as a major piece of that puzzle. The war changes everything. Todd Gitlin, an activist in that period, said the war drove us nuts. Anytime you try to do something, the specter of Vietnam is behind you. Right? And, and who puts that, you know, best example, that's Martin Luther King. I mean, King becomes famous and wins a Nobel Prize for being a civil rights leader and ends his life as an anti-war critic. He sees that you cannot separate these two things. They are part of the same uh, uh, social net, the same social fabric. Right? So the movement and the 1960s in Vietnam are all intimately connected. I think they also speak, and we've talked about this before, to the nature of liberalism in the 1960s. The type of movements that are occurring at home and the war, I think, are both products of post-war liberalism. Post-war liberalism, among other things, requires growth and reform at home and expansion abroad. Reform abroad, if you want to call it that. Liberalism leads the United States to make a commitment to, for example, end apartheid in the American South. All right? Liberalism, I think, also leads the United States to take an active role uh, 
and defeating Ho Chi Minh, nationalist, communist, whatever, in Vietnam. Okay, liberalism is the driving force in post-war American society. It leads to huge economic growth, but that economic growth also, also leads to problems. It leads to half the, well, not half, but a significant number of American people being left out, particularly African Americans. Liberalism leads to uh, uh, global growth, which leads the United States into Vietnam. So in many different ways then, Vietnam and the reform movements of the 60s are tied intimately to this idea of the liberal world and liberalism has its discontents. There are people both at home and abroad who have issues with liberalism, who don't feel that they've benefited from it. At home, the critics of liberalism include, can include student groups, civil rights groups, women, uh, ultimately right-wing groups. I mean, supporters of George Wallace and Richard Nixon who have more power than anybody else actually, right? And critics of liberalism can include Ho Chi Minh, and Mao Zedong, or whoever else. So, the dominant world, the dominant liberal world comes under attack in the 1960s. Liberalism comes, comes under attack at home through these various movements and it comes under attack abroad with things like the Vietnam War. Right? To talk about these movements requires a great deal of nuance and time and more, more of both than we have. So I'm going to kind of go at it fairly quickly, but I want to talk about the main forms of it. Uh, and to begin, I want to talk about the anti-war movement because what's obviously the most clear connecting uh, event between the war and the movements at home is, of course, the anti-war movement. And this is kind of taken out of context because the anti-war movement comes out of other movements. What you have in the 60s is kind of a, a conveyor belt, almost, where you have certain movements which come off a conveyor belt, but they're influenced along the way by other things that are going on. So you have a civil rights movement, which, you know, from 1954, the Brown versus Board case, is making steady progress. You know, you can chart the main events in it, the boycott, bus boycott, and uh, Little Rock, sit-ins, and so forth. But then, boom, Vietnam shows up. And all of a sudden, that civil rights movement is much different than it had been, all right? You have a movement for student rights and participatory democracy, and you see that going along. And then, boom, all of a sudden, Vietnam comes along. And SDS, for instance, which starts as a group committed to participatory democracy, all of a sudden becomes an anti-war group. What happens? Well, within those anti-war groups, a lot of the guys who are supposed to be the good guys, right? They're fighting against the war. They're doing all these great stuff. Well, they treat women in those movements terribly, miserably. They're patronizing and patriarchal. So what happens? Boom. You have a women's liberation movement emerge out of that. Kind of a spin-off from the anti-war movement. And you have environmentalists who see the tactics of the new left and the Vietnam era as being something they can adopt for their own purposes. So boom. You have another conveyor belt. And you can use any metaphor you want. I just choose that one. But you basically have a chain of movements, and Vietnam affects every one of them. Some it creates, some it kills, some it co-opts. Civil rights, for instance, which I'll talk about. You have a mainstream civil rights movement. Vietnam comes along, and I think more than anything else, radicalizes the civil rights movement. And so you have this movement from King, who is accused of being an accommodationist, uh, the kind of uh, we shall overcome era to a more militant black power movement and King himself, if you can see this, this transition in his own words and his own work at that time. So Vietnam basically affects everything. So the anti-war movement is a product of that too. The anti-war movement doesn't appear out of nowhere. All right? It's based on the ideas and the tactics of the civil rights movement. And it comes out of actually a commitment especially toward participatory democracy on campuses, right? So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm not sure, outside of World War II, if there are any American wars that don't have significant opposition to them at home. We kind of have this, you know, again, this kind of a TV mythic image of the Vietnam anti-war movement, and it's become kind of parody, you know, hippies with flowers and all that kind of stuff. Um, but again, I don't think it's that much of an aberration. Uh, if you look at most wars, the American War for Independence, a third of the country, according to John Adams, was opposed to it. Civil War, you had draft riots, people who didn't want to fight. World War I, there were thousands of people thrown in jail for opposing World War I at home. You had the, you know, uh, uh, the Sedition Act, Woodrow Wilson, making it a crime to oppose the war, throws Eugene Debs and others in jail for it, Red Scares. Uh, World War II is 
perceived differently because it's the good war against Hitler. And Vietnam, of course, has a huge anti-war movement in, in numbers probably by far the biggest in terms of numbers of people publicly and actively opposed to American policy, but again, not an aberration, right? So in that way, you know, it's different probably for the magnitude, but in terms of opposing the war, probably nothing new. Um, the movement began actually as offshoots of other movements. The ban the bomb movement, 1950s, there was a strong movement begun by Bertrand Russell and other pacifist and church groups to end this threat of nuclear annihilation. Groups like SANE, the Committee for a SANE Nuclear Policy. So there's a global movement then to end the threat of nuclear war, ban the bomb movement, or somehow de-escalate, or have arms limitations, or something like that. All right, a lot of the Vietnam anti-war movement comes out of that. The Vietnam anti-war movement has precedence in the civil rights movement through uh, um, you know, its connections to groups like SNCC uh, or uh, many of the leaders, people like Tom Hayden actually were actively involved in civil rights in the South and then adopt those ideas and tactics to the anti-war movement in Vietnam. So the movement begins, it has different disparate sources. It begins in churches, in the Ban the Bomb movement, in the civil rights movement, on college campuses, in pacifist churches. Ultimately, it takes in businessmen and ministers and politicians and housewives and school kids and just about everybody else. The media throughout the 1960s and even now tended to either stereotype or parody uh, the uh, uh, anti-war movement. Uh, they were hippies, they were communists, they didn't know any better, they were only out trying to cover their own butts because they were afraid to fight, um, you name it. However, if you, prob if you had to come up with a model demonstrator, it would probably be a middle-class white American with strong political or moral reservations about the war. Uh, in the initial days uh, when the, the movement was just getting started, it would probably be a college student. But by 1969, when the moratorium to end the war in Vietnam and the mobilization against the war in Vietnam take place, over a million people participate in that. And it's overwhelmingly kind of middle class people in small town USA. It's John and Jane Doe rather than Abby and Jerry and the Yippies and people like that. There's plenty of those folks still around. And, you know, in fact, I see a great purpose for them. I don't, I'm not trying to criticize them, but in fact, the media portrayals, I think, are, are really in many ways a caricature. I've talked to people who in the early days of the war said, oh, yeah, we were at rallies and there'd be a hundred of us with suits on listening to, you know, some minister talk about the war. And they, the media, the TV would show one guy who had flowers in his hair and was, you know, saying whatever, right? You know, kind of taking a more radical approach. He had a beard and look kind of crazy and everything. So the media would focus on that one person giving you the impression that that's what the movement was when in fact, you know, most of the people there were, you know, in coats and ties. You know. so, um, so the movement there, I think, kind of defies stereotype in that regard. It has various sources, uh, the Ban the Bomb movement, the Beats, you've probably heard of the Beatniks, talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, the Beatniks, uh, you know, uh, people like Ginsburg, Kerouac, uh, it's embarrassing, Naked Lunch, Burroughs, um, folks like that. I mean, you know, not only are they kind of stretching the bounds of what you can get away with, and they're talking about themes of sexuality and personal liberation, but there's also a political impact on it. Allen Ginsberg was a political activist. Uh, he was involved in just about every major anti-Vietnam action that was going on at that time, so there's an influence there. Groups like SDS, um, Ben Spock. A, a real link there. Spock was active in the anti-nuclear movement and the anti-Vietnam movement. In fact, runs for president in 1968 on the Peace and Freedom Party ticket. Um, there's not much of a movement, however, to speak of before 1964. In the initial phases of Vietnam, as I've said many times, most people don't know much about it. It's not really on the radar screen. You have a few people who are saying, hey, you better watch out. This could become a mistake. But by and large, it's ignored. The first time you really see any movement on Vietnam publicly uh, occurs in late 1964 and the crystallizing event there is the, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. It seems that this is the first time any significant number of Americans say, whoa, what's going on there? Before Tonkin, you know, you will see isolated, you know, maybe an article in The Nation or in Common Wheel, which is kind of a, a Catholic left, a liberal Catholic magazine, talking about Vietnam, but other than that, it just doesn't have any uh, 
any uh, bounce as a, as a story. But after Tonkin, people started to take notice because after all, this is played up on the news and you have this Gulf of Tonkin resolution. So people start to take notice and you start to see more activity, especially on the college campuses. And at the time, SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, which is a major group of students, college students especially, uh, calls for a, uh, a national demonstration against American intervention in Vietnam. And they issue this uh, for April of 1965, right, which is just after combat troops have come ashore at Da Nang. Uh, they expect a few thousand people to show up, but they actually get what for them is considered a very good turnout of about 25,000. Right? And again, if you've ever been to marches in D.C., 25,000 is pretty small. But it's Vietnam. It's early 1965. Nobody really knows about it. A student group, which is very disorganized, has called it. And yet, you know, it's a pretty good turnout, 25,000. Around the same time, a group of teach-ins begin. And a series of teach-ins begin. And this probably, in terms of the media, has a greater impact. Teach-ins are simply debates and lectures about Vietnam. And they occur at college campuses. The first teach-in was in Ann Arbor, University of Michigan which is where many of the leaders of SDS, the founders of SDS, attended school, especially Tom Hayden, Al Haber, Sharon Jeffrey, Rob Ross, a bunch of others. Kind of, We hear a lot about Berkeley and Madison in the 60s, but Ann Arbor, Michigan, was up there with any of them in terms of student activism. And in really many ways, it's the roots of 60s activism. You can find a lot of them in Ann Arbor. So the first teach-in was in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan, and over 3,000 students participated, a staggering turnout. And the thing went for like 24 hours. You'd have professors and students debating Vietnam. You'd have a, maybe a professor of political science or geography you know, with a map of Vietnam telling people where it was. And some people, you know, maybe somebody from Asian studies would talk a little bit about Vietnamese history. And a professor of American history might talk about American foreign policy and a professor of economics or you know, whatever. And you would have, they would invite um, defenders of the war, administration officials want to come there. Uh, and, and so forth. So, you know, this is really a huge success. Based on that, in May of 1965, uh, 122 colleges linked by satellite to Washington, D.C., uh, and telephone lines have a national teach in. And up to that point, it's the biggest teach in going. Uh, and again, you know, the, the sponsors, the organizers of this are staggered by the amount of interest. Uh, now, um, Again, critics would later say, well, it's a bunch of guys who didn't want to go to the war. You know, I'm not sure that invalidates their opposition to it. But most people who study this actually have concluded that there actually was more of it was kind of a uh, more of a, a moral or a, uh, revulsion of what was going on there. This is a time of liberalism, right? It's a time of, you know, holding hands and blacks and whites getting together in this real sense that, you know, we were solving all our problems and taking them on and we beat Bull Connor. And you know we can we can get along with everybody, and so this this idea that the United States is seen as an aggressor in this small country just doesn't jibe with the picture, right? This isn't what America does. Uncle Sam doesn't act this way. You know we're the good guys. We're John Wayne. We wear the white hats. So most Americans have been born and grown up with that, and now they're given this information about Vietnam, which doesn't seem consistent with that imagery they have. So a lot of college students who are you know, college is a time when you're supposed to expand your mind and learn new thoughts and theories. So. This doesn't really square with what they've been taught to this point. So there really is this kind of uh, shock and, and outrage at what's going on there. So uh, the sponsors and supporters tend to be very surprised by the outpouring of support they get. Uh, at the same time, in 1965, you start to see more hardcore, more militant action. Students begin burning draft cards to protest uh, the selective uh, service system. Um, they might uh, block troop trains, a famous event in Oakland. I think this is later in 1966 where hundreds of anti-war protesters sit on the tracks to prevent troop trains from uh, bringing soldiers, new soldiers in uh, to the induction center. And the most, I think, most powerful uh, statement in the early years of the anti-war movement, uh, uh, copying the Buddhist bonds as six Americans actually immolated themselves. Uh, and this is really pretty much an unknown story of the anti-war movement. The first, which is really quite powerful, uh, was uh, in Detroit, an 82-year-old survivor of the Holocaust named Alice Herz uh, immolated herself to protest the war in Vietnam, burned herself to death. Uh, six other people did the same thing. The most famous was a man named Norman Morrison. Morrison was a Quaker who had very profound pacifist convictions. He was in Washington, D.C., near the Pentagon, uh, 
he had his little daughter with him who was a few years old at the time, handed her off to a relative, sat down and burned himself to death. McNamara could see it happening from his office window and apparently it affected him quite a bit, although, um, cut off a little bit, a, a story which actually I found quite disturbing. When McNamara's book came out, uh, he went to great lengths to talk about how wrong and how sorry he was. Well, at the same time, Norman Morrison's widow, who's still alive, wrote a letter to McNamara basically saying, you know, for all these years, you know, past, you know, I'm a Quaker, I don't hate anybody, but I've always thought of your connection to my husband's death and the war in Vietnam and whatnot. So, you know, I'm really happy that you were able to come to grips with this. I know how difficult it must be. And, you know, it was really good of you to finally admit that there was a mistake here. You were wrong and da da da. McNamara gets a hold of Morrison's widow and asks if he can use this letter that she wrote in, in his PR stuff for his book, right? So this is, this is McNamara. Um, just kind of a side thing, uh, not, not one of my favorite folks. And I never said I was objective, okay? <laughs> uh, immolations are fairly rare, thankfully, uh, and not a whole lot of people do that, but the movement does grow. And as all movements do, a staple of it, of course, becomes the participation of celebrities. And you start to see celebrities drawn in because obviously people want to be around stars, and it's not hard to find them. You have uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein, Woody Allen, Gregory Peck, uh, Ginsburg, uh, you know, the usual suspects from the 1960s uh, all showing up. You have uh, uh, academic figures, people like William Allen Williams, Noam Chomsky, uh, others who begin to speak out against the war. Uh, SDS has an important role to play in this. Tom Hayden, Paul Potter, Carl Oglesby become icons of the 1960s radical student movement, right? There's also a problem, though. Almost as soon as the movement against the Vietnam War is started, it is divided. You have newer, younger students who tend to be fairly militant. Older stalwarts like Sane, David Dellinger, A.J. Musty are a little bit turned off by the younger people whose rhetoric can be a little you know, flagrant and who sometimes will show not only opposition to the American War but support for the enemy. So, of course, the stereotype is all full of VC flags at the anti-war moment. But there, there would be there. I mean, to suggest that everybody was carrying was ridiculous. But, in fact, you would see pictures of Ho Chi Minh or flags of the Viet Cong at anti-war rallies. That was not uncommon. And there was a general attitude among many that, you know, the Viet Cong were the good guys in this one. And so there was not only, you know, anti-Americanism but pro-VC uh, signs as well. Um, Sane, in fact, uh, uh, which is an old line group, uh, anti-nuclear group, uh, uh, criticized the younger kids because they were not expressing, quote, responsible criticism of the war. You know, it's okay to criticize the war, but you have to be responsible, patriotic. Uh, they're the guys who come to the anti-war rallies in their nice black suits and white shirts, whereas the kids might have on bell bottoms and t-shirts and headbands or flowers or whatever, longer hair, beards, you name it, right? Volkswagens, Mustangs with a little red book. Um, what happens? Well, SDS doesn't buy sane. It doesn't buy this idea of responsible criticism. So, for example, at a major uh, a rally in D.C., the president of Students for Democratic Society at the time, Carl Oglesby, uh, talks not only about the war in Vietnam, but the liberal system, corporate liberalism, which I'll talk about later, which drives the U.S. And he basically indicts American society rather than just, you know, the war in Vietnam, just, you know, everything's wrong. And this turns off a lot of the old line liberals, people like Michael Harrington or Irving Howe, Norman Thomas, who was an old socialist candidate for president. And so there's a real split in the movement then between the older, uh, kind of more liberal critics of the war and the younger, more radical uh, people who criticize the war. Um, they, they, uh, a lot of the older activists claim that these guys are pro-Viet Cong, they're unpatriotic, they're disloyal. Um, in fact, people like Tom Hayden, Stoughton Lind, who was a famous historian, Herbert Apthecker, who was a communist historian, and of course, who better, what better symbol than Hanoi Jane, Jane Fonda. All these people actually traveled. Joan Baez actually traveled to Vietnam. Uh, most of them have gone off the hook. Fonda uh, went, went over the edge, I guess, for many when she actually sat down uh, uh, in the uh, turret of uh, an anti-aircraft gun and had a picture taken there with a helmet on her head, kind of simulating shooting down American planes. Uh, many went there and came back with American POWs, uh, Baez and Apthecker, and, and uh, actually Lynn Apthecker and Hayden, I guess, did that, and Baez separately did that. But I mean, this, this was kind of taboo among the old left. They thought this was way over the edge to actually travel to the enemy's capital and talk to the enemy. Um, and when 
when younger activists started going to the White House and chanting things like, you know, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Or, you know, ho, ho, Ho Chi Minh, NLF is going to win. That was over the edge. And so you see a real split. And the active mainstream, or the activist anywhere movement becomes more young and more radical. Uh, despite those tensions, the movement grows from 66 to 68. In 1966, you start to see mainstream opposition to the war. For the first time, establishment uh, leaders take it on. In February of 1966, J. William Fulbright, who's the chair of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, has televised hearings on the war. Fulbright, remember, he had engineered the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He had been on LBJ's side. But he starts to have misgivings, and by 1966, Fulbright is against the war. He has General James Gavin appear. Gavin blasts the war. George Kennan, the father of containment, blasts the Vietnam War. Um, Ex-commandant from the Marine Corps, David Shoup, gives a public speech, and he says, if the United States had and would keep our dirty, bloody, dollar crooked fingers out of Vietnamese fairs, those people will determine their own fate, not have one crammed down their throats by Americans. It's an ex-commandant of the Marine Corps. Hans Morgenthau, political scientist, comes out against the war. Howard Zinn, famous historian. Chomsky, George McTee Kane, Gabriel Kolko. You start to see now a movement on campuses and uh, within uh, uh, the academy and politically opposed to the war in Vietnam by 1966. And this is only going to grow over time. All right? And we'll pick up next time with that.